When John Williams approached Steven Spielberg with the F, F sharp of the Jaws theme, Spielberg first responded with, you're kidding, right? But that F, F sharp gives us the zeal of the monster of the shark. It lets us feel that emotion of it. If there's no score, it's just a camera going through blue water, and that's not scary. If John Carpenter's piano and synthesizers aren't playing, Michael Myers is just walking down a street in a jumpsuit. Not scary. No John Williams score on the opening credits of Star Wars? How do we know that there's fanfare there? Music is key to building the narrative of the film story. Our next guest is Henry Jackman composer of the Captain America franchise, the Kingsman franchise, X-Men First Class, and working right now on Disney Plus's The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Guys, this is another episode of Film Nation. This time, the score. All right, guys, welcome back to another very special class. And today's guest is Henry Jackman. And he is someone you have literally grown up with. Uh, you heard him on the score for Monsters vs. Aliens, Big Hero 6, Wreck-It Ralph, Kung Fu Panda. And as you've developed and seen more films, and as you've matured, you started going to see the Marvel films, you heard his scores on Ca the Captain America franchise, the Jumanji franchise, Kong Skull Island, Captain Phillips, and now, now you get to hear him on the amazing Disney Plus series, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Henry Jackman, thank you for joining our class. Welcome to uh, our classroom. We really appreciate you being here. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Your art, your craft is a key component in the storytelling process. The Hollywood myth, the old myth of the process, is that the composer would receive the film, a finished film, watches it, composes the score, gets an orchestra involved with it and, and scores it. But that's not really the truth. That's a false myth. You're involved with filmmaking much earlier than that. Do you mind sharing how early do you get involved with the film's development and what is the process of your craft from the pitch to the release? That's a really good question. Although, even when you say it's a myth, the, the, the kind of simplified version you just gave, in some cases, isn't that far off okay. what it still is. But, it, but you're right, it's a very simplified version. Um, apart from anything else, uh, it depends on the sort of movie. So, for example, with animated films, they take longer. You know, they, you, a big animated film, like a Disney animation film, Pixar, that kind of thing, DreamWorks. Um, it's a four-year process from them, you know, cooking up the idea, deciding they're going to make the film to it being released is sort of four years. So in the case of an animated film, I've been cordially invited, you know, down to Disney or DreamWorks in early stages where there is definitely no movie to watch, but they know what they're doing. They know what the script is, but they got more than the script. They've got storyboards, they've got uh, good artwork, you know, and so even at that early stage, um, I could, and when I say early stage, this might be two, two and a half years before okay. it comes out in the cinema. I can read a script, but not only that, I will go and have a meeting where I'm starting to see storyboard. I'm starting to see what San Francisco will look like, you know, in Big Hero 6. So you can mm -hmm. see the design, you can see the artwork and all of that, you know, it, it just, even though, you know, you won't be writing the cues for that movie until much later in the process, it's a, a really handy, introduction it affects your subconscious apart from the else you might be working on another film but having those meetings means rumbling around in the back of your subconscious mind is the beginnings of ideas you know and when you're even if you're working on something else when you get a spare moment you'll just suddenly remember that meeting or you'll remember a shot or a piece of artwork and you'll it'll start to inform the vocabulary for the movie the textures you'll start to have ideas about Maybe in the case of Big Hero 6, Wreck-It Ralph, all these non-orchestral elements, you know, all these synths that you're thinking about bringing out of the cupboard, kind of techniques, production yeah. techniques. And um, 
So in the case of animated movies, you may be having some of these interesting creative dialogues and even seeing just little sequences. You know, they might be really working on a set piece um, part of an animated movie that they intend to use for the trailer. So they do actually have a few parts that are quite a quite a long way down the line. And you know, it's it's apart from some finalized. Um, uh, you know, graphic implementation, it looks pretty good. So it can be quite a staggered process where you've got script, discussion with direct directors, you've seen storyboard art, you've, and you've even seen particular sequences. Um, live action tends not to be, I mean, it depends, you know, some movies are so huge, they take forever. Um, but in the case of, let's say, Marvel films, by the time I get involved, there's a first cut. I mean, I've read, no, that's not quite true. In, with the Russo brothers, I will have read a script and had like an initial discussion early okay. on. Um, just sort of, especially with Joe and Anthony, you know, just a tonal discussion about, because um, for example, with even, I mean, I'm a massive fan of Alan Silvestri, but the thing about um, Captain America Winter Soldier, it was quite a tonal departure from the first Avenger, because the first Avenger was like a period. I mean, Alan wrote a great theme for Captain America in that first one that utterly suited the patriotic stirring period kind of 1940s version of first avenger that couldn't have been more suitable for that movie and so when i was talking to the russos it was a conversation about how different you know when you get to winter soldier of course steve rogers has woken up in 2012 he's a, he's a fish out of water in a modern well it's a completely different tone so it's those sort of conversations uh, that you might have you know initially and then with most live action movies, by the time I'm sort of rolling into view, there's usually a first cut. Okay. Um, which isn't a million miles away, to be honest with you, the difference between the first cut, unless you know they run into some sort of real creative difficulty, the first cut I receive and what ends up in the cinema is usually you know ironing out and tweaking. It's not like it's a completely different, crazily um, different version of the movie. But of course that does affect music, you know, because if you, if you write too many important scenes too early and there's important edits and snips, you know, your, mm. your music sort of, you got a lot of figuring out to do because it's now 26.3 seconds shorter or it's, you know, 40 seconds oh, longer. Wow. Or, or, um, but uh, so, but you have a very good idea and especially in the, the higher the quality of the director and the studio you work with, the more likely it is that that first cut you get already represents uh, a good established narratively coherent version of the film that's not going to descend into some massive argument between the director and the producer and then they reshoot and everything changes you know the more harmonious the director producer studio relationship the more likely it is that that first cut you get represents you know a pretty decent implementation of what everyone is on board with and that's what you want because you don't want to be spending you want to be spending your time working on the score in terms of best supporting the narrative and getting into all the detail, writing the music as best as you can, having the time to record it properly, not scrambling because the picture and the ideas are changing and characters are being deleted and reshoots are happening because then it's more like a dog chasing its tail. It's much better to have a harmonious, uh, when there's a harmonious vision of what the movie should be because then you're spending all your creative time on writing the best possible music and not having to chuck it in the bin and start again because the whole of act three has been reshot and changed do you, um, do you find it i mean is it often that you've written something that you have to chuck because there is such a creative revision by the director and producer it, it's very rare now i mean maybe more at the beginning of one's career that can happen because okay. people are in a bit more of a mess i mean with joe and anthony russo they're such good to, i mean just to take the captain america examples I mean, I can't think of that. In all the movies I've worked on, of course, you know, there's always some part of a movie where there's a bit of a just, do we need this? Or should we tighten up this narrative thread? Does right. this need to be explained better? Do we need one more scene that follows the storyline? Do we need to tighten up? Are we lose, losing momentum? And of course, all of that will affect music. But I've not been in a situation where it's like, aha, I've written, like for example, on the second Jumanji film, I wrote this big pompous, sort of amusingly over the top, class, almost classical baddie, tune for I can't remember he had this German name like von I can't remember I can't remember his name now uh, no uh, Jürgen the Terrible you know uh, so Jürgen the Terrible had this theme I spent time on you know and there's no way that halfway through Jumanji anyone's gonna go you know what we've changed our mind we've thrown out you know Jürgen the Terrible's no you know because they've shot the movie they know what they're doing and that was the central um, you know evil adversary so 
I honestly can't think of. Uh, it, I mean, it does. It famously does happen in movies okay. where you know, with the best will in the world, people run into trouble, and you know, directors get fired, and new ones come in, and reshoots yep. happen. And but I've been, I've been lucky in that respect that I think almost all the movies that I've worked on, the first cut I get is just a, a fractionally looser version of the tightened up one that ends up in the cinema. Okay. Now you've mentioned your partnership with working with a director and you know, you're composing the score, but you still have a huge team that you have to deal with. Uh, you're, you're, you have to appeal to the film's producer uh, and the vision of a director. You also have to work with the sound designer and the uh, editor in, in, a, in a way, as, as well as your own team. Um, how much freedom do you have in the creativity of a score and who amongst all of those are the probably the biggest influencer on how the score develops other than your own vision? Well, that's a really good question because and, and it's so case dependent. I mean, okay. it depends on, you know, oh, it depends on so many different factors. Again, I would say I've been quite lucky and it also depends on what point you are at in your career. Okay. If, you know, when you're really early on in your career and you're not necessarily established, there would understandably be maybe a bit more nervousness about whether this person's going to get the music right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and uh, and so that, you know, that makes sense. The more, I mean, let's not use me as an example because it'll sound, um, you know, uh, it'll sound cocky, but like, I don't know. If, supposing you're doing a movie and you, and you, you know, you rung James Newton Howard and you're lucky enough that he's available and he's decided to do it for the, whatever the budget is and da, 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 da. Not many people would be going, well, I don't know, is this going to work? Is James Newton Howard any good? It's like, you know, you've got James Newton Howard, it's going to be, now, of course, there's still going to be creative discussions about what to do. But when you're at a certain point in your career, the reason you hire someone is not to trample all over them and not let them do what they do. The reason mm. you've spent some money on someone quite established is because there's obviously something that you would like to happen that you've seen a track record of happening before. Now, so it feeds into two different questions. Now, if you're lucky, you will have a director, uh, like many that I've worked with, in fact, most, if not all, where it's a magic combination. Of, of course, the director has the final say, of okay. course, they have a vision of the movie. And of course, they will not ever go, oh, I love this piece of music and what it's doing for the movie if they don't. But what you need is the magic combination of knowing that the director has the final say in all things related to the movie. Mm -hmm. But they, they also understand that if you've hired someone because they've got a track record of bringing something unique to a project, you allow them to do precisely that and let them do that. And then during that process, give your guidance. If you spend all your time trying to second guess the composer and sort of half write the score yourself and trample all over it, all over it, all you'll get is, is a sort of poor directorial version of a score that, that will be a manifestation of their own musical limitations. Okay. You know, in this, do you know what I mean? In the same way that, um, I don't know, I'm not an engineer and I don't know how to build a suspension bridge. So what I would do is I'd hire a really, I'd just find out who is the best, who's famous for, for nailing like really good suspension bridges. And I probably wouldn't get that involved. I might suggest that, like, you know what, for me, I wonder if we could have some nice, you know, is there any way that, you know, I might suggest a couple of things. What I'm not going to do is go, right, let me build this suspension bridge. Like, because that's not what they do. But on the other hand, as a director, you will have overall oversight of what this suspension bridge looks like. You know, it's a terrible analogy, but my point yeah. being, my point being that most directors uh, are sensible enough to realize that if you've hired someone who you creatively believe in, part of what you're looking forward to is letting them off the chain for them to do the very thing that seems to have happened on many other movies and you're quite looking forward to happening to yours. Now, once, once that has been established, so in many of the, most of the movies I've done, I will be left to, I'll go like, here's, here's what I think the Winter Soldier should sound like. Here's what I think Kong should sound like, you know, and I'll write a suite or I'll write a theme. I'll start there having had, you know, conversations. And, you know, if you're really lucky, that'll be, oh, I love it. This sounds fantastic. Or it'll be like, oh, I love this. You know, this bit here sounds a bit romantic for me. It doesn't sound, and, but whereas this bit here, you know, play this bit, this bit I love because this sounds like the perfect combination of uh, an aggressive monster, but also something sympathetic. Whereas, you know, this earlier bit maybe felt a little bit too romantic. So that's informative. If I write an initial standalone suite that's not to picture, 
those okay. sort of discussions with the director are interesting. So I'll be like, okay, that's interesting that they reacted to the, and I'll look back at the piece and go, well, you know, it's probably a combination of that particular orchestration, that use of harmony for them was maybe, you know, a bit too romantic. I'll bank that, I'll clock that and go, well, that was interesting. And then they really responded to this other bit. I'd be like, well, that's interesting because that's when I was using like superimposed tritone harmony and this and that, and they really, really like that. Right. Um, so you're learning, you know, and so just without realizing, you then join this dance where if you're lucky, the director leaves you alone to come up with your raw thematic material. Then okay. you get it, then you get into the detail, you start writing the cues. And it's it's just a wonderful collaboration, a dialogue. You'll play a cue if you very occasionally a director will go, hey, that's fantastic. I've got nothing to say. I'd be almost suspicious and nervous if they did. A good, a good director has always got something to say, not because they feel they have to, but right. a director who'd respect to go, Henry, this cue is fantastic. I love it. The only thing I've got like two ideas, you know, I'm just thinking that maybe some of that mysterious feeling in the piece started a bit early and we could hold that off a bit. And maybe, and we'll identify a point in the picture. Maybe that mysterious thing should start here, like 10 seconds later. But then my other thought was maybe then as it gets bigger, it could crescendo even more. And then when you get the reveal, like maybe if, you, if you've got any more tricks to hit it even harder, I'll take it. You know, that would be a classic kind of a dialogue where you've got a okay. first go at a queue, they like it, and they've got two great um, filmmaking ideas. One is for them, I'm slightly leading a feeling too early, just hold off in the piece a bit longer. And then for them, you know, it could have could have gone, you know, maybe when I wrote, it, I was thinking, hey, I'll save some orchestration for later because this is like the first time we're seeing the mighty Kong. And they're like, no, 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 don't do that. Hit me with everything you've got. And I'm like, OK, I'm glad we had this conversation because I was thinking maybe we save that for the second reveal of Kong. No, 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 you did. That, that's the sort of dialogue you might have. And so you go back to the piece and go, look, we're in great shape. Piece is basically, you know, director likes it but he's made two really good points. Those can be addressed. And then very often you'll make those changes. Yeah, guys, right, you know, when you hold off that mystery feeling for 15 seconds, start a bit later, it's just like, it, it works. It's more surprising to picture. And then, you know, when you execute a director's notes, if they're good ones, your respect goes up. Because so mm -hmm. sometimes in the early part of your career, you may get notes where you're going, that's a terrible, you know, they'll say something you're like, what on earth are they talking about? And you have to do it, you know? But then when you're lucky enough to work with great people, the reverse happens. You write a piece of music, you already think it's pretty good. You implement some of the ideas they're talking about. And then when you see the result and go, well, you know what? The first version was good. This version is like uh, even better. That contributes to your respect for the director. You come back, you play the piece and go, hey, so listen, I, I, I took those notes and here's the second version. And, and, the, and the relationship develops because the director's like, oh, he's not one of those egotistical nightmares who doesn't listen. He listens, he's gone away. He's basically listened to the two things I said and he's done both of them and it's great. I love it. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, this relationship develops and, you know, occasionally, I, I mean, I think dialogue's really important. You should never, if someone starts saying something and you're thinking, what the hell are they talking about? I don't understand what they're talking about. You should always stop and go, hold on a minute. Um, let me, let, let's try and get, forget specifically talking about music. We've got to get to the bottom. You know, sometimes you'll hit a tricky cue. You've written like three different versions. And there's been slightly vague conversation. You're like, wait a minute, like just everybody slow down for a second. Let's get to the bottom of what's going, you know, not in an aggressive way, meaning the solution isn't just more and more writing. The solution is, the, like, especially coming from the background you have of like teaching and it being a sort of classroom experience. It's almost like revert to a literary criticism mode of like, okay, here's a scene, it's three minutes long. We've had three versions of it. We've had a vague discussion. I don't really feel like We've got to the bottom of what is the idea of the scene? What are the mechanics of the scene? Mm. You know, it could be a scene where several complicated layers are happening at once. So it's like, so what's bugging you about it? What should, let's try and figure out, given there are many ambiguous paths that music could take, you know, mm -hmm. let's try and have a discussion where we figure out what could be the most effective role of music, you know, because you'll sometimes get a scene where there's many different ways to skin the cat. Sure. You, you could you could you could score something that is being quite literal and describing exactly what's happening. You could score something subtextual so that you're hinting, you know, you're producing a feeling in the audience slightly ahead of where the scene is to sort of lay pipe for something later in the mid. There's many different approaches you could take to a scene. And often if you get a little stuck on a scene, it's not for want of just writing more and more music. It's for want of a clear, creative, articulate discussion about what 
that's not to say that always works because you can have like okay i think we got a creative plan and then you do it and the director goes go henry i'm so sorry i thought i was gonna love it if we took this route but now i hear it <laughs> but very often what happens is they go now i hear this version where we're doubling down on how unexpected you know we're, we're doing the sucker punch thing where you think everything's fine now i hear that version it's made me realize what should be happening i finally you know what i mean so even right. Going down a road uh, that isn't uh, the, the final musical road that you choose can be informative, um, you know, in respect of, uh, I don't know, supposing um, there was a scene where uh, you were feeling, you know, let's say in Kong Skull Island, the protagonists enter this cave and they see all these mysterious Kong representations of Kong in the kind of mythic cave art. You right. know, one way to play that would to be make it terrifying. It could be like a sort of Spielberg beat where like, you don't see the beast yet, but you see the wall paintings and you do an almost horror cue where it's in anticipation of the mighty creature. Right. But then, then the thought could be like, well, I don't know. I think that's the wrong move because actually uh, in terms of this particular tribe, let's say in this Kong movie, Kong is a, a figure of a religious and mythic importance. And actually maybe this is a really good opportunity in the movie to do a sensitive, sophisticated sort of mystical kind of cue mm which stops Kong feeling like a, just a simple two-dimensional raging monster and right. makes you realize as an audience um, for, for this tribe, he's actually a sort of, he's, he's a God and he represents, and you know, so decisions like that on what to do with music can completely change the fabric of the movie where without you realizing you're watching the movie and suddenly because you're hearing this sort of mystical piece of music, you're now thinking of Kong as a sort of religious figurehead for this tribe right. and not just a crazy, aggressive gorilla so it's an amazing beautiful way to continue the narrative of the story because as you were just sharing you know you had a, you know you could take a two-dimensional he's a monster but instead yeah. giving him more a complex mysterious uh endearing kind of sound to it which just hearing it the audience wants to is engaged to know more of like what is this beast that's that right yet to but, see. but it, it's case by case because some cues you don't want to do that some cues sure. kong needs to just feel like an epic scary monster you know and these are all those decisions and you know amounts of do you know are we going for out and out horrifying physicality do we want to introduce a little bit of the fact that he you know all of these are discussions and decisions and and this this is the sort of central part of the collaboration and to answer your question i mean generally it's the director Okay. Just going back to this, just going back to the how many people involved. And again, it's like, how long is a piece of string? Some movie projects, the producer is very confident in the composer that gets hired and until and unless they hear anything disturbing or they hear any music they hate. Right. They, you know, some producers are there at every music meeting. Some producers go, hey, listen, you know, when you've done the first couple of reels, you know, send us, send us a selection of cues. And if they watch down some scenes and go, oh, this, time, this sounds great. They kind of check out and go, look, these guys know what they're doing. Let's not interfere. Other producers absolutely love music and they attend every single music meeting. Some relationships are such that it's absolutely clear the director is completely in the driving seat with the producer almost respectfully there to monitor the process and the occasional comment. Some mm -hmm. relationships are such that the director is sort of in the back seat, you know, and the producer is, you know, animation tends to have stronger, like Jeffrey Katzenberg, for example. Okay. And John Lasseter are very hands on. That's not to say the director isn't important, but, you know, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Katzenberg would be hands on in every aspect of the filmmaking, more say than a producer for a live action movie, just because of the slightly different way animation set up. So these relationships come in so many different shapes and sizes and the same is true for picture editors some picture editors attend music meetings and you know are the, are the loyal you know lieutenant of the director and say very little and some are fantastically helpful often not so much in the grand thematic ideas but picture editors can be enormously helpful because they have such a close handle on you know they put together everything frame by frame which sometimes can be their downfall <laughs> the, the, the only downfall to big charity is when they can be like, oh, could you, could this theme, like, if you just move that note there and then you just, is it, no, music doesn't work like that. You can't just right. keep taking notes and moving around by frames, like yeah. special effects. But the good picture editors have often have fantastic uh, notes to do with, this is fantastic. I think we should just pre-lap this piece okay. by three seconds before. These often um, 
uh, more structural notes because they have such a firm grip on the literal fabric of how the movie's been put together. They're always worth listening to. And it's not just that, really good picture editors like Jeff Ford and Lee Smith and oh, I, 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 loads. There's a, I can think of 10 who are in the sort of epic category of filmmaking. They, they, they don't often intervene, but when they do, it can often be with a, a great filmmaking type note, not a, not a you know, a small, uh, structural type note, but you know, a, a big, uh, a big idea, a big thought type note. You know, just because great picture editors have made loads of film, they just have a lot of filmmaking experience. Right. So, it's usually I would say director, picture editor, and producer. And in the case of these epic, you know, like the Kevin Feige's and the John Lasseter's, there'll be a sort of final playback, okay, where they they have a sort of overarching view of the whole score. You know, and and they they've already heard loads of it before and, and you would know if it was all going in a direction they hated you would definitely find out about it <laughs> but if they like what's happening you know uh they'll just make sure in a final playback that they're completely happy with everything and how it's all been balanced in so the the real answer is it, it it's so case dependent and you know if you work on an indie film versus a blockbuster but, mm. and, and it, it can just entirely depend on these relationships but in the main picture editor director producer okay and occasionally, going back to your bridge analogy, the most of the people you're working with are like, Henry, thanks for building this bridge. It's great. It's functional. It's it's allowing us to get cars and people across. Can we change maybe the pedestrian handrails a little bit, or the lights yeah. goes kind of thing? Or even you know you, you know when I, Cherry was a really challenging movie. That, you know sometimes it, when you do when you're working on something really experimental, right then. It, you know, all, and, and you tend to do that with direct, when you have a really close relationship with directors, you don't mind, excuse me, doing crazy things. Sure. Because you're working on, first of all, your relationship with them is so good that you sort of don't mind, as it were, making mistakes because you're, you're more likely to experiment to a more crazy extent. I mean, on Cherry, there were definitely things where I was like, you know, what, I'm going to push the boat out and try this like crazy idea. And, you know, we'd listen to it and so I go like, yeah, I think it's too, it's a bit too Baroque, you know, it's a bit too there's a, too much of a wink to it. It's too self-referential. It's a bit fourth wall, you know? And so like a whole, that wouldn't just be a small thing. That would be like, let's just abandon that idea. The whole sort of, you know, them trying to break in to get a lot of, uh, you know, illicit drugs out of a safe, being a piece for sort of harpsichord and feeling a bit like a bark ripoff meets kind of Morricone is, it's, it's a little too uh, clever, clever. It's a bit too self-referential. Let's scrap that idea, you know? So you do get things where you just go, you just go, hey, I wonder what would happen if we tried such and such a radical idea. And then you try and go, yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Forget that. Let's try something else. Now that you've mentioned Cherry, and I want to get to uh, repetitive motifs in a little bit, but the, the, the score that you have to Cherry is absolutely gorgeous. It is a beautiful soundtrack. I absolutely love it. And I noticed there was some uh, motifs and your melodies. I, I, I want to talk about that a little bit later, but I mean, just to compliment you on that soundtrack, it was absolutely one of my favorite ones. Truly, uh, it's a pretty well, piece. I've been listening to it a lot here recently. So, uh, well done on that part. Yeah, well, it took, yeah, that was, uh, uh, I think we all were because, you know, the, their last movie was the Avengers movie. So, you know, it was a radical change from what they've been working on. And I was right. actually happy, happy to, to do something of a more, you know, experimental nature. So, which is a great segue to my next question for you. Uh, you're getting a new project, whether it's something like Cherry or Captain America, the Falcon and Winter Soldier series that you've done. When you get a new project, are you sitting at the computer, at a piano, a different instrument? Are you taking pencil and paper first? Uh, how does it go from what's in your head and in your heart to that's what really we as the audience here. Well, that's another how long's a piece of string question because it, it, it depends on the, you know, when you have, um, I'm just trying to get to the camera here. Um, when obviously very few scores are just all on the piano. Okay. Uh, but if you're working on melody and harmony way before you have to worry about, you know, how it appears and, what the speed is and what the arrangement is and stuff like that. You're coming up with the basic DNA of something. I avoid the computer because okay. you should you should just try and like for example with um 
uh, one of the things I was really proud of in the Falcon and Winter Soldier thing uh, show is that in Captain America Winter Soldier, I had this one little motif for Falcon, but I didn't get to develop it that much because he tended to have like one amazing move on screen and then it would go back to the cat thing. But yeah. there was this thing that went... Um... <laughs> and that's all I got time for, and, you know, things moved on. Uh, but so for example, on Falcon and the Winter Soldier, I was like, ah, the good thing about that is now he's the central character. I don't just have to stop there. I should take that first motif and develop it, you know. So the original idea was that, you know, that it had these three chords. And the idea of, you, you know, that was from the original Winter Soldier. But I deliberately was ever so slightly thinking ahead because I thought Sam Wilson was a bit cooler and his background was different to right. Steve Rogers. So this harmony of three, four, one. You know, from a world of you could easily, you know, I didn't play it like that. But my point being, this three-four-one harmony has has a, a, an origin in blues. That's not what I was doing, obviously, because it's a heroic. And I was like, ah, but I don't have to stop now. I can finish the tune. So this is an example. I sat at the piano, going, well, you know, if the first phrase is. Now I can keep going. That was the harmony. What's that one? Oh, sorry, I messed that up. to finish the whole tune now that i that i would do on the piano obviously that doesn't sound it there's a piece called louisiana hero it doesn't sound yeah. anything like that because i'm just figuring out all the chords and the harmony and louisiana hero i ended up with this rhythm that went and then the guitar goes down 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 do 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 you know but then halfway through guess what happens the brass come in the horns right So I'm not winging it at the computer. By the time I get to the computer, I'm just arranging because all the ideas have been nailed. You know, same with like Jumanji, for example, is a more traditional, um, you know, say a lot of Captain Phillips, for example, wouldn't be done because yes. it's, it's so textural. You know, it's not uh, based on the uh, a sort of grand superhero theme with melody and harmony, but you know, something like... <laughs> B section, I can't even remember now. Um, anyway, the point being that I will figure out all the arcs of the melodies and, and harmonies way before I get, because by the time you get to the computer, you should be focusing on, on the orchestration, not going, hmm, I wonder what the tune should do. It's like, no, no, you should have nailed that beforehand. Okay. Um, but not always, you know, when it's something a lot more, some of those cherry tracks are so odd and weird and full of like weird bent guitar sounds and everything. You know, it's not a piece of music made out of melody and harmony. Now the big piece was, you know, I, even even with Cherry, which is very experimental, that last piece, the come down, it's a lot more minimal. It's no, it's not as traditional, but I do remember sitting at the piano going, I think I need some sort of minimalist motif and then a basic idea that that I can then twist a lot, do all sorts of crazy things. But let, again, let's start on the piano, and that, I think I just sat down and went. sound a whole lot on the piano but I kind of knew there was something to it you know and then it became that big theme that went you know it doesn't sound a whole lot on the piano but of course you know you get all the Vangelis synths out and get put it all together and it's like a kind of jigsaw so um the more textual and, and sort of weird something is the less likely you are to be spending ages on the piano because you're not really figuring out melody and harmony and the more thematic something is you i think you're better off 
uh, at a piano at that point. So that by the time you hit the computer, you're not being deceived by, um, there's a discipline to having to figure something out at the piano. Now, I apologize on the naiveness uh, on this for me. I mean, I grew up uh, in the 70s. And, and so like my image uh, of, of a film composer is, you know, John Williams standing in front of a huge orchestra uh, and conducting, conducting this humongous uh, fanfare uh, of a track. With what you've been mentioning with the computer, I mean, technology is, do we still have those gigantic orchestras? Oh, yeah, or can no, we do yeah, most yeah. of the stuff on computer? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you're absolutely right. That is the picture you just painted of Mr. Williams at the podium with the full orchestra in front playing away is still, I mean, I, I say that from a privileged position. There are an awful lot of projects whose budget does not allow for the hiring of a huge symphony orchestra. Okay. I've been very lucky so that every movie that we've described, of course, I'll put it together on the computer. So okay. director, everyone gets to hear it. It can be approved and everything. But then guess what? At the end of the process, once the score has been approved, there you are at the Fox stage or the you know Warner stage or in London at Air or Abbey Road. And sure enough, the, the picture you painted and mm. saying, oh, well, maybe it's enough. That is exactly what happens. A, a, mm. An enormous assembly of some of the world's finest musicians all go into one room and you have this hugely exciting week where you record it all. And uh, now, you know, I'm sure there are some composers who would listen to this and go, oh, lucky for him, if only he doesn't understand. And, and it's true. I mean, you know, there are projects where they make it quite clear. Listen, you know, we don't have the money for that. And unlike the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, even the early noughties, samples are so much better that it's right. not a total embarrassment. I mean, when you watch any streaming show, those that are not big budget, you know, you will hear, it's okay, if it's more electronic, it doesn't matter so much because you're not having, you're not trying to, you know, mock up an orchestra, but you know, there's a fair amount of fake orchestra with really good samples. It's not the end of the world. It's still a no. great opportunity for a young composer, you know, to get going, even if there isn't the budget, you can still demonstrate that you're good at composing and the more you know i would recommend if you don't have any budget and you can't record a real orchestra you know maybe just record a couple of solo instruments to layer on top of it to give it the life uh and then maybe pick a style if possible where possible depending on what the movie's about where it's not just orchestra because okay. obviously uh, non-orchestral elements are going to be fine when it's not real but yeah, well, everything. I mean, there's no way you, you the, the, you're doing a Kong Skull Island for legendary pictures, and they go, yeah, so no, we can't be bothered to record an orchestra. That's like the, that's the highlight of the whole process. And and right. so your the picture you painted is absolutely correct. That is exactly what happens. Okay. Now we we've mentioned some recurring motifs through the narrative of of music, and again, I, I love it in Cherry. I, I love it in X Men First Class. But part of your job is to build character through that motif and, and melody. And as the character develops, the, the motifs develop. It's because of the music motifs are developing. We can sometimes uh, tell that the character development is also occurring. You did this brilliantly with Captain America uh, Civil War. That movie, you had a ton of characters that are, some of them had already had pre-established musical sounds and motifs to it. It's also a movie though that is ideologically split. You know, you have Cap mm -hmm. versus Iron Man. Uh, and so your music beautifully seems to take into consideration the changes and the conflicts between each, each side, but also between each character. What are the challenges of developing a character through music in this way? Well, that's a very good question. I think one of the ways I handled it in Civil War, given there were so many characters, was not falling into the trap of being literal so that okay. every time every time you see a character, you hear a theme pertaining to that character, because that's not helping the story. That's just more like a, a costume. Right. The most important thing about the movie Captain America Civil War was the ideological split in the proposition that superheroes should be more accountable and they have to sign the accords and be held accountable to the UN. And so you end up with two teams. So instead, so one of the really important themes for me became the Civil War theme, which more mm. spoke to the overall discord amongst the superheroes, rather than every single interaction. Otherwise, you'd be peppering music with an inexplicably irritating concoction of themes that don't add up, add up to something narrative. Whereas the Civil War theme, um, 
had built into its DNA and its harmony something that was epic and rhetorical, but also something harmonically slightly unstable and something a bit tragic. Mm. And so that was really useful. So, so, and it reached its culmination, you know, the big fight at the end between, um, uh, Buck, you know, Winter Soldier, Bucky, Cap and Iron Man. It was like a sort of clash of the Titans operatic fight at the end. So by then having hinted early at the Civil War theme and it having developed through the airport scene, I was able to do a sort of big, almost Wagnerian representation of the Civil War theme at the end. And that's a good example of trying to have a more elevated approach to music because you could take the attitude, oh, look, it's a massive action fight between three characters. The music should be, you know, full of percussion, very aggressive. It's like, no, 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 let's not do that. Okay. Because we, we've had plenty of action. The whole point of this epic battle at the end is it's almost more an emotional fight. Yes. And it's almost mythic. It's a sort of combination of Clash of the Titans Right. And it's got an it, and it's got an emotion to it. It's not really about fists and banging and hitting. It's physical force being used as a metaphor for the now heightened clash that was set up. All you know, don't forget these characters all met up early on, having a fairly civil discussion about which way they would go, on what you know whether to agree with this. But it's gone from there to the end of the movie and turned into the most epic fight imaginable. Um, so it's musically justified that the Civil War theme by the end should be an operatic, almost classical, um, uh, you know, and therefore influenced, you know, by the, by the Wagners and the Strausses of this world, you know, and it pitched more in that sort of musical uh, area. And so that's why that, you know, that cue right at the, that portion of music towards the end becomes very grand and, and operatic. And that, that's, that was deliberate, uh, but it's also the summation of this civil war theme that had been brewing through the movie and in the early parts of the movie, of course it was nowhere near as dramatic and operatic uh, because it was just becoming established. But the good thing about establishing it early, earlier and picking it up through the movies when you do get to that climactic scene, right. it's, it's, it's the payoff opera version okay. of, a the of a theme that's been seeded throughout the movie. So you planted our seed, the planted the seed for us to hear in the early parts. And then you, yes. then you blossomed it uh, when you had, in essence, these brothers that are at the end. Because it is a brotherly love. It's yeah. not just two guys fighting. It's, it's that's why it's such a terrible fight. Yes, yeah. that's why the fight's so uh, terrible, because, it, because they're close. Right. But yeah, if you watch that movie closely, in, in, the, in an early briefing, um, that the character played by William Hurt, who's Colonel, I can't remember his last name. Right. He's basically showing video going, okay, guys, everyone appreciates what the Avengers do, but sadly, you know, buildings do fall down and people die. And it, it's a sort of video montage where they're not feeling too good about themselves because it's like, okay, the downside to having all these superpowers is unfortunately people do get caught up in the collateral damage. Right. And even that cue has a little bit of that Civil War theme in mm. it because it's the beginning of the reason for oh, wow. why that these superheroes uh, are being asked to fall under the um, you know prescription of the UN and these accords come about so but you know it's a more it's a sort of veiled slightly tragic version as this presentation is being given um, but you know the seed is there even in an early scene like that yeah okay <clears throat> very cool very cool now now I'm gonna have to do my homework and re-watch it because uh, just <laughs> yeah um Henry, we, uh, my seniors uh, are getting ready to move on into their next phase of life. They're either going to go into a career immediately, go into the military, or, or go into college and shortly do whatever their professional career is going to be. The reason why I'm bringing that up is when, you talk, when I've heard you talk about um, Captain America, Winter Soldier, you, you shared that that was a that first pitch to the Russos was a, a huge risk because it yeah. was something drastically different than what the first Avenger was. Um, my guys, since they're getting ready to go into their first professional career kind of thing, it's awfully tempting for them to not stir the pot, uh, just do what is expected of them. Uh, but you've already shown that you can succeed by taking a risk. What do they need to know on how to take a risk and how do you decide when it's worth taking a risk and when it's not worth to take the risk? That's a really good question. Um, 
I, I would say some of it is, you know, it's easy for me to paint this picture of me being, you know, oh, this amazing artist taking all these risks, but, you know, notice how it was at a certain point in my career. Okay. You know, uh, uh, earlier on, when I knew very little about the mechanics of things, mm. I mean, I've been very like musically educated, but music to picture, you know, it's a particular discipline. And I definitely benefited from a sort of a, a, an apprenticeship Okay. When I was in the when I was in the Zimmer camp, you know, doing very like mean, pretty much being a fly on the wall and doing all sorts of, sort of menial tasks that you know weren't that important. But the point being, a sort of I don't know what I'd call it, a period of apprenticeship during which okay. maybe deciding to take on the whole world in one massive swoop isn't necessarily the order of the day. <laughs> you know, it, who knows? Again, it's like how long's a piece of string? Because you may have. Um, you know, you might be teaching someone who like the very first thing they do, they get asked to do something and they come up with some completely left field thing and it's brilliant and it launches, you know, there's there's no fixed way uh, to get to where you want to get to. There are so many different ways to skin the cat. But I would say that because it's such an arduous and complicated discipline, mm -hmm. there is absolutely no harm in banking uh you know, a version of apprenticeship where you yourself may not feel at that moment, I feel like I'm giving full artistic expression to all of my ideas. I mean, I certainly didn't feel like that. Okay. But I had the, I also had the humility to realize that wasn't appropriate at this point. Because although I think I have really interesting musical ideas, I don't think I'm burnished enough in the bric-a-brac and the detail and all of the millions of other factors that come into film scoring. Okay. Um, now it depends, you know, if you're asked to do something, it's only four minutes long and it's for a short movie. Hey, you know, do, do what you want. But I, but it, it, I would say if you feel like you have not yet given full voice to some interesting artistic ideas you have and you're very early on in your career, don't panic. There's nothing wrong with being part of a process or only being mm. involved in one part of a process. All I would say is if you're very diligent and you work really hard and you always look at any musical task that you're involved in and do more than what would be expected, it gets noticed. That would be my only piece of advice. And it could be anything. If you find yourself in a situation where someone goes, uh, there's a piece of music, uh, uh, you know, there's hardly any time, uh, can you have a go at doing the percussion for this piece? And you just bang in a couple of things and just go, oh, that'll do. Now, it, you know, it might be terrible. Now imagine someone coming in the next day and go, hey, did you hear the percussion that that guy, what's his name again? We should uh, bring him in. He's great. What I, I, I just listened to it. It's amazing. I, you know, I was expecting some kind of half generic bunch of tigers. Well, they, they, he really thought about it. It was great. Or she, or, you know, whatever. Right. My point, my point being, I wouldn't, if you find yourself in any type of apprenticeship, I would just say whatever falls to you to do, I would just aim to over deliver okay. <laughs> because what's likely to happen is someone goes oh that's it who did who did that she's cool what, uh, what you know uh, I asked for such an even if you think it's something dumb like oh um could someone organize every single can someone go through all the cues of all the Captain America films cut out the audio and you know make it organized to, to get every harmonization every version you know Cut to person number one sitting there, resentful, bored, going, this isn't writing music. I've just been there, blah, blah, blah. And they do a sort of half assed job and there's a few versions and you listen to it, go, hold on, this is missing loads. There are loads that they haven't. Cut to person number two, you come in, everything's color coded. They've completely nailed it. There's even a little note saying, okay, these ones are in G major. These ones are in C. Go, wow, who, who did this? They completely over. This is like the best presentation I've ever seen. It actually makes me understand all the cues I've written even better than you know, even having written them, they've organized them all. Like whoever this person is, like, where are they? And bring them back, <laughs> you know? And that's in something that isn't even writing music. It's just an example I'm trying to give. Right. Of don't, I mean, it took me a long while, you know, I, I didn't get involved in film music till my mid thirties. So never feel entitled that you ought, someone ought to be asking, you're a genius. We want to hear all of your music and we want to let you do whatever you want right now. And here's loads of money to do it with. Right. That's right. unlikely to be what happens. So try not to get frustrated and try to believe as I perhaps idealistically do. But I think it's true that almost regardless of the task, there will be a way to shine at that task. Even if you think at, at, in a really early stage, it's not even a task in which you're directly 
writing music, you, you always have the chance to be way above average, which basically means working harder, being diligent and thinking. And I only say that from my own experience. That's basically what I did. I would often be given all through my career, all uh, you know, menial tasks that I massively over delivered on. <laughs> and then, you know, it gets noticed because it helps people's lives, you know. Right. And then they find out, oh, actually, he's pretty good. And why, well, why don't you have a go at such and such? And now that's only from my own experience. You get people give you a completely different speech going, ignore that Jackman speech. That was completely meaningless. You should go into a deep meditation, ignore everyone around you and just do exactly what you want and be uncompromising. Go, this is my piece of music. Take it or leave it. And if you've got any notes, bugger off. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't necessarily advise that myself, but I'm sure you could find a composer whose career started from a very uncompromising, you know, start where they wrote something and didn't give two hoots for anything anyone wanted to say. So, you know, um, that's why you should interview many different people and get many different opinions. But I, I definitely think there's no crime in apprenticeship and there's no crime in humility and there's no crime in patience. <clears throat> Great words of wisdom there. So, all right, Henry, um, thanks again for that bit of wisdom. Now we've come up to the segment, what we like to call is five quick questions. It's sort of like a little game that we will do here. Uh, I'll try and be brief. I, I will ask you a question and you just come up with what comes out of your gut as quick as you can. Are you ready to play? Oh, yeah. Shoot, as long as it's not what's the capital of Bolivia. <laughs> it is, that is not, not the question. Okay. All right, away we go. Question number one. Oscar-winning composer Elmer Bernstein once was quoted as saying, the dirty little secret is that we're not musicians, we're dramatists. Do you agree with that? Yes or no? Yes. I basically agree with that, yeah. I would say my much more pompous academic way of putting it is the secret weapon to film score is literary criticism which is the same thing. It's just a much more pompous way of saying it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question number two. You are in a very dire predicament, dire indeed, and you need some rescuing and saving. Which character that you've scored for, would you want to come rescue you and why? Would you want Captain America, the Falcon, Eggsy, Baymax, Kick-Ass, or the Missing Link? You know what? Let's get, I'll get pull it. It'd either be Cap, Vulcan, or Bay. The thing about Baymax is he's going to have a lot of. Depends what. If I'm in a real physically bad situation, I might have to go for Baymax because he might even have some extra software and like healing stuff that could, you know. I, I don't doubt the bravery and courage of Captain America and Falcon, but like having got me out of trouble, I don't know if they've got any mad, you know, extra. Mm. I might go for Baymax because he might even be able to do like open heart surgery and, you know. He, he, he might have the extra chops. That is a very intelligent choice. I, I complete, I think I had not even thought of it that way, but I agree very much, yeah. very much with that. Question number three, uh, we're gonna say I am a, a magical wizard of, of some sort here. So I am going to give you a gift. Uh, and this gift is you get to compose any event in the future that you would want to. It could be the coronation of the next British monarch. It could be the Olympics or the World Cup. Whatever you want to compose, what would it be? Not limited to your imagination. What would you want to compose and why? Uh, well, I can think of certain things, but then they're so epic that I would feel unworthy to be the person <laughs> assigned to compose them. I, I mean, Imagine, uh, hopefully there'll never be another one, but imagine, you know, at the end of some hideous world war that had been so destructive, it had, you know, threatened the very sort of, you know, continuance of humanity. And finally it's over and some sort of massive global reconciliation and peace agreement is at hand. Everyone's hugely relieved, whatever. Uh, and so there's some enormous, uh, global event which is a sort of formal mm. end to hostilities and a formal I don't know some genius load of diplomats have figured out a way that we can all live together without blowing each other up and this is to be celebrated you know not just with some boring paperwork signing and a load of politicians in some you know grand event with incredible and it would somehow incorporate you know all the different nation states involved in this terrible conflict in some very clever uniting 
uh, you know, artful uh, sort of operatic piece that would be a, some kind of 21st century opera that would somehow include, I mean, it's so pretentiously ambitious that I should already be just discounted for the one bit. But can you imagine, you know, it would be, I mean, you, there, there's basically, I can't think of any other events that would be as, as, as you know, an amazing and significant event to have been to, to have participated in on be on behalf of humanity. But I mean, you know, that's so unrealistically over the top that, of course, that would never uh, happen. But you know, you asked me for if you were a wizard and it was a magic wand. Uh, the only the only bad thing about that idea is, in order to get that incredible resolution, mm. you you needed to have a hideous world war, which I you know obviously. <laughs> Uh, don't want so um, yeah it has a lot of flaws that idea but the idea of some massive uh, coming together it, you know that celebrates all sorts of different ideas and, and cultures would be a huge uh, challenge it could be something really interesting uh, you could also mess it up <laughs> a, a humongous peace accord for for humanity in which this is the uh, triumphant march who knows maybe uh uh, maybe you could compose something for the, our when we finally are victorious against COVID. Then there you go. That would be a slightly less uh, you know maniacal <laughs> <laughs> uh, version of it, and also wouldn't require some new horrible event. Yeah, a, a, a sort of a, a celebration of humanity piece uh, as as the world comes out of a you know what's going to cause quite a lot of repression. Absolutely. Question four. Somehow we have managed to build a time machine for you, uh, in which we're going to completely disregard like all laws of time machine right. and, and things like about. Avengers Endgame. There you go. And you get to run across young Henry Jackman, who is at this point still working with Sill, Elton John, and the Art of Noise. What is young Henry going to say to? well-established film composer, Henry. How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say, what would the older version say to the, you know, exuberant youth, youthful version, but what would the young person say, I guess I'd be really happy because the, um, having had such an eclectic musical background that had so many influences and some of it being really strictly classical, and being, you know, almost like over-educated in music. I always found it a bit, even though I had a great time working in records, I learned loads about synths and production. I was really privileged to work with the people I worked with. I couldn't quite find my place, you know, and I didn't know where to put this knowledge of Brahms and Debussy and Benjamin Britten and all this orchestral music. And so I felt a bit lost sometimes. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if there is a home for some musical person because I of this type because I'm not a DJ but I do know about electronica I'm not I've worked in rock bands but I don't want to be a rock star I don't I'm not so strictly you know I'm a bit of all these things and so maybe I'm gonna be nothing you know so if I saw the older version I'd be like oh I found the, the, the person who knows you know has this really diverse musical background I can quite find a sort of place to land in it looks like I figured it out and this older version is thankfully instead of kind of moping around doing nothing useful I obviously managed to find a home for these sort of diverse musical things so I think I'd uh, look at the older person and go oh I think I might relax a bit because I sometimes got very frustrated when I was younger thinking I don't really know where the avenue to land mm. these different musical influences is and maybe I never will so if I met the older version I'd go ah relax obviously something good happens along the way <laughs> There you don't, go. Don't get so angsty about it, which you, you know you do when you're young and you're passionate about music, and you don't, you know, if you can't, it's difficult to find your way when you're younger. And of course, there's no guarantee you will. Yeah, it's the great unknown. Exactly. So, um, right. so it would have calmed him down a bit, seeing that the older version found a, a good musical place uh, to use these, uh, you know, musical attributes that got picked up along the way. Mm. Question five for you, Henry. Now that you know what we are doing in the, this classroom, who would you like to invite uh, to continue our conversation? Well, let me give, because I don't know, some of them might be a bit unrealistic. I would say straight off the bat, bat Hans, uh, because I learned so much uh, and was very lucky to hang out with Hans Zimmer. So, mm -hmm. I mean, he's obviously so busy. That, but you never know you never know so the, i'm gonna throw that just in case you know he's just got like a day between 
uh, gigs and is just and suddenly goes, you know what? I will, do, you know, you never know. So I'm going to say Hans because he, he's great. And um, in the same spirit, I would say Harry Gregson. If if he's not available, I would say Harry Gregson Williams or John Powell, both of whom again because I yes. could put in a call, you know, and I you know I'm friends with both of those guys. And you know it's luck of the draw because you know, I've just had a kid and I, I've you know I've got a week where I'm not having to sit in front of the computer. Um, so I'd go Hans, John Powell, Harry Gregson Williams, and just to throw one more in there, if, not, if all of that falls through, because oh, I'd love to, but we're absolutely slammed on these movies, can't get. I'd throw in a real odd, uh, a, an underappreciated composer who I think is a genius. is Elliot Goldenthal. I think he's an absolute genius. And I, I've probably already been rude by saying he's underappreciated because, you know, look him up on IMDb. He's a distinguished and highly successful composer. But I, I just um, feel he's uniquely talented, maybe in a way that not enough people uh, are aware of. I think that's a better way of phrasing it. I, I don't want to belittle his amazing career. Um, mm. So uh, that, that's a healthy selection. And I can put in a good word for three of those. And uh, might even be able to help you with the fourth. And if they all fall through, I'm an idiot, uh, and you'll have to find you'll have to find someone else. But I can certainly try and help with uh, the majority of those suggestions. We would love the help. So thank you for putting in the good word, and uh, hopefully we can make uh, at least one of those happen. So thank you. please don't blame me. If it, if none of those happen, I assure you, it's not because you know I'm somehow a, you know a more gracious person. It'll be because they're so slammed they just literally can't. Well, Henry Jackman, you have played five quick questions. You have enlightened us so much on the art and the craft of composing uh, the score for a film. Thank you so much for being with our class today. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Henry. That was awesome and entertaining and fun. I really appreciate you being here in class with us today. And also thank you for putting in the good word uh, for us on maybe who our next guest is gonna be. All of those composers are absolutely outstanding. Guys, hopefully you took a little bit from this and you now know how important it is for a film's soundtrack to move the narrative forward to build the emotions of a character. As always, fellas, remain awesome, be nice, stay safe, and listen to the music. See you guys.